Welcome to Plotlines, where we'll use our over 30 years of experience in real estate communications to uncover the real stories behind real estate. I'm Heather Crowell. And I'm Brittany Acrovo. Dive in with us as we invite guests to break down the ever-changing landscapes of real estate together. Welcome back to Plotlines, everyone. We're here today with Anton Pick, who is an acquisition analyst for North Point Capital and a portfolio manager for the NYU Shack REIT Investment Fund. Um, so Anton, maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit and tell us about your journey in CRE and, um, and, and your work at both North Point and NYU. Sure, of course. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm from France, born and raised in Paris. Um, I've been, you know, like many of us in the CRE industry, I think, um, real estate is kind of a family thing for me. Okay. So my, my grandfather is a real estate investor. Uh, he's been in the business since the 70s, probably. He founded CoFinance, which is one of the, you know, very first uh, investment, real estate investment firm using kind of the private equity model. And also probably the very first that did the jump um, because he started in France and he quickly jumped to the U.S., to the New York City market. He used to own one Times Square back in the days. Okay. Uh, it's one asset that you, you guys may know. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the company is still around. Um, and he's been kind of my mentor and my hero when I was a kid. He always wanted to do real estate, uh, like my grandfather. So, so here I am. Um, uh, I moved to Spain when I was 18 to study for four years. I was in, in Madrid, Spain. Started getting the basics of, of finance and real estate. Did my very first internship when I was uh, when I was there, and I've been kind of all around the the spectrum of real estate investment from acquisitions to disposition, mm -hmm. asset management, fund management. I, I've kind of tried to, to build my career as a um, kind of really get a global understanding of the of the business. And I've been involved in many different kind of transactions from healthcare to forestry. Um, oh, wow. And that's a class that people don't, don't usually really know. And it was, I never expected that that would happen to me, but it was actually <laughs> pretty, pretty fun to get involved into. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. What a great journey. Thanks for sharing that with us. So um, on plot lines, we're all about rewriting and, and discussing headlines that we're currently seeing in the news. I know we're going to focus mo mostly on multifamily investment with you today. So um, two headlines that we've seen recently, kind of contradicting each other. Um, don't miss the best time to buy REITs. And then the other one said Wall Street hates REITs like it's 2009. <laughs> so um, I figured we could start there. What is your outlook on the space given the current economic conditions? So, yes, yeah, definitely a tough environment for REITs. They've been extremely volatile. So I've been following them for the past year mm -hmm. as I was um, a portfolio manager for the New York uh, University uh, REIT Investment Fund uh, at Shack. So it's definitely been a very tough environment for them. The REITs are super, super uh, affected by interest rates. Mm -hmm. They almost trade like bonds. So mm -hmm. interest rates go up, their prices drop. And... For the past few months, we've been really seeing that trend. Like whenever uh, the ten year goes up a few bips, um, the um, the reads are affected like instantly, and you can just follow. Like if you do a correlation analysis following the two graph, you're gonna see it's the that the correlation is, is crazy. So it is a very tough environment for reads, and if you're an institutional player playing large amount of capital and you mm -hmm. have some very strict requirements in terms of, of volatility, it's definitely you know. A challenging time to invest in REIT and when you're reading all the headlines it's getting a very bad sentiment on the sector so it's definitely tough but I think it's maybe one of the best time to to invest yeah. in, in REITs you know it's when you see this huge distress times that you really mm -hmm. should invest in, in REIT 208 was you know the best time to invest right. in real estate in your life so right. so it's kind of the the same story here there is um, you know most of the REITs are trading at a very steep discount to NAV yep. so you know, and it is like the, the fair market value of what the, the REIT should trade at. And, and currently there's a, a huge discre discrepancy here mm -hmm. and also huge discrepancy between these listed REITs and private transactions. Right. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, that's the reason why players like Blackstone have been acquiring a few REITs recently because they are seeing that huge discrepancy between private and listed market and they're taking advantage of that. Um, and they've done that for uh, single right. family rental with the Canadian REIT Tricon in the beginning of the year and more recently with our community, uh, which is really a multifamily yep. 
I'll yeah. read. Mm -hmm. So, so given that, um, mm -hmm. where do you see that like the biggest value play in the REIT space, right? Which one, where do you feel like it's undervalued and you're comfortable with the fundamentals and, you know, there's an opportunity for, for, you know, REIT investors to get in at the, at the ground floor. Um, so the three sectors with very strong tailwinds right now are everything residential. Sure. Yeah. Um, I love manufactured housing a lot. They're very yeah. well positioned, um, you know, because they're here to tackle the big issue that we have in that country, which is affordable housing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're perfectly positioned for that. Um, they're trading at a very steep discount to NAV. Um, mostly, you know, can go around 20% discount to NAV maybe. Um, same for retail, especially if you take uh, grocery anchored yeah. uh, retail REITs, they're still trading at a very steep discount to NAV, but we're seeing uh, a strong growth and, and a strong pickup in, in retail REITs uh, for the past year. And, uh, and healthcare and data centers are the two ones that are also have very strong, you know, long-term um, kind of uh, secular tailwinds, but they're not trading as such as a discount as, um, right. as the others. Yeah. yeah. What about the public market versus the private? Any thoughts there? I think it's definitely the time for, for investors, especially, you know, if you're kind of a smaller investor, maybe an individual investor to, to place money into, into the, the public markets. And, uh, you know, if you're going to place into S&P 500, you're really betting on overvalued tech stocks. If right. you're looking at yeah. REITs, you're looking at, you know, very undervalued sector that is, as a super strong, it's not going away, you know, like right. Google, it's one of the largest company ever, but if tomorrow some company can make a search engine that's better than Google, Google is, is gone. It's over for them. For NATO or, you know, um, Simon Property Group, their properties are here and then they're never right. going to move. They're, they're going to be here forever. Right. SL Green, one Vandal built is not going to disappear tomorrow. That's I mean, hopefully right. not, but it, it <laughs> should really not. Um, that, yeah, so... So switching gears or pivoting and, and focusing on multifamily for a minute, a lot of the narrative that we hear about multifamily is, um, you know, affordability and supply constraints. And um, how does that how does that inform your, you know, your investment decision in terms of where where to invest in multifamily um, and, and kind of maybe moving multifamily up in the um desirability factors i mean so it's also yeah definitely a challenging time for for multifamily because of the oversupply in some sub market mm -hmm. especially you know obviously the, the sun belt um but because of the you know more recent headlines and more you know kind of all the problems hitting the fan recently mm -hmm. we've been with some very very strong uh, adjustments in prices um yeah i've seen properties transact at like 40 percent of what they were trading for a few years ago and and i'm seeing a huge spread in cap rates between the very prime class a properties that every um institutionals are bidding on i've seen transaction recently um in mid four so 4.5 cap mm -hmm. um in like dallas you know like oversupply market you're gonna bid four five which is below treasury for um an oversupplied product um seems really odd but I've also seen um, a lot of transactions around six. If you mm -hmm. go into more tier two locations, and if you look at markets that haven't been oversupplied like others, or if you're looking at more class B properties that have a naturally affordable component uh, to them, then there is a very strong rationale here to to get into them because their their prices have adjusted because of all the supply that that came into. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That sure. came in recently, but they're not really competing against this brand new luxury class A right. class A um, housing. If you're, you know, if you have a more um, lower income, you still need housing, and you're not gonna be uh, going into this brand new uh, luxury yeah. property that just got developed. You're going into um, what you can afford, and and these properties are where where people should uh, should look at and what people should should buy, and that's what we've been focusing on. Um, recently at, at North Point Capital. And Anton, you mentioned manufactured housing. I mean, talk about a space that gets, um, right, a negative yeah. connotation, yeah. but it's interesting. I've been reading a lot about that as well as sort of a, a hot investment or asset class to be looking at. 
Tell us a little bit more about the, the benefits there um, and what you're seeing. Um, so it's really a sector where you have to, to work with people that really know what they're doing. It's a sure, sector that's yeah. kind, of, kind of niche. And, but when you, you look at some, some of these REITs, uh, UMH is one that, that comes into, into my mind. They've been here for you know, uh, 20, 30 years. It's kind of a family company. And they know what they're doing. They've acquired a lot of um, of space where they can place these uh, manufactured homes that they're themselves producing here in the U.S. Um, so they have all these lands that they've acquired at a pretty good basis. And right now they are, you know, implementing the strategy that they've had, which is uh, building these uni these units, putting them into the market, and you know, uh, vacancy in manufactured housing is close to zero. It's like wow. you have. You know, if you have a house, um, you have the manufactured housing in that lot, it's going to get rented. Um, and obviously the rent growth are not going to be as crazy as what you can get on some other right, type of right. product, but there is still uh, a stable rent growth and very low vacancy, which makes the, the project very, very appealing. And the investment thesis, if you're getting into the REIT at a discount, um, very attractive. Hmm. As I understand it, you were involved in one of um, France's largest healthcare transactions. Um, can you, can you tell a little, us a little bit about that and, and maybe draw any parallels between that and the, the market today? Yeah. So that was back when I was uh, at the BNP Paribas in, oh, in right. Paris, France. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it was a transaction that was really, it's a bit more than 20 assets, um, between France, um, Italy, Germany, so it was kind of a European transaction, okay. and we were uh, liquidating a fund, a healthcare fund. Um, so we're selling all these assets as a bulk. It was a huge transaction. We had a, a few banks helping us on, on the sale, and it was yeah, definitely super super interesting. And it was a, a tough market. We were still into the you know post COVID era, but it was mm -hmm. not yet the highest interest. The you know interest rates were not starting to spike yet. Right. Um, inflation was slowly starting to pick up, but people were not really thinking about interest rates or, or nothing like that um, and transactions were, you know, pretty active. Uh, it was a great, great environment. And, and to draw a parallel between multifamily and healthcare, um, most of the portfolio was nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And nursing home is kind of the sector that also have a very, has a very, very strong um, long-term demographic tailwinds because of the aging population. Sure, yeah. And when you're in Europe, you have very strong um, help from the state um, for elderly to get housing and to get uh, into these nursing homes. So you have, you know, your demand is going to be here and it's going to stay stable and growing for the next, you know, decade in the sector. So that's a sector that the big institutionals are very, very um, attracted to, uh, just like multifamily and residential in general. And mm -hmm. you've seen all these biggest names just buying healthcare and buying uh, residential a lot these past years and uh, i think this this trend is going to keep going and as an investor it's always good to have these big institutionals around because they can buy you out and they can pay a premium versus yeah. uh, versus others you yeah. just don't want to be bidding on the same assets that they're bidding on because you're going to get outbid and if you're trying to outbid them then you might right. overpay for the asset because your cost of capital is probably not as good as as theirs right so it sounds like yeah like a lot of sectors in that that touch on housing there's a supply demand issue that that we're kind of benefiting that investors are have are seeing a benefit in um are there what are there sectors in the commercial real estate space that you think are seeing kind of um a slowdown in demand and maybe too much supply i mean i think we can all point to a few <laughs> but um curious what your what your take is on that office you know we've been uh, talking about light quite a lot this, this past yeah. years um and i think it's still gonna be a very big challenge for the sector um, it's still hard to really see where how and when it can you know start yeah. getting better for, yeah. for the sector because retail for example got super affected by you know the, oh everybody's gonna order online now right. and and amazon and all of that but you know you're still gonna shop and you're still going to to need yeah, these, yeah. these places and same for office, you're, you know, I'm going to the office every day. Most of us are, are going to the office. Yeah. So office are not completely going to go away. The issue is really um, a shift in, in, in use. 
yeah. uh, in the way um, the tenants are approaching these buildings, but this shift um, is kind of happening everywhere. So right. let's say multifamily, for example, we're seeing more and more tenants, um, they care more about the amenities now than the units themselves. Right. So let's say when we're thinking about value-add projects, we can and we try to invest more into the amenities rather than, you know, getting a granite countertops because people care less about that and more about having a business center in, sure. in their right. uh, multifamily uh, yeah. community. Like in their center. Yeah, makes sense. All right, Anton. Well, I started this conversation with some headlines that we're seeing and, and asked for your reaction. So now we want to give you the opportunity to rewrite the headline. So what would that look like if you were able to write your ideal headline about multifamily REITs or just the REIT market in general? So I guess it's kind of the headline that uh, all of us are, are waiting in the real estate industry. So, you know, multifamily transaction peak and REIT surge after Fed announced a 25 bit uh, rate cut. Yeah. <laughs> okay there you All go right. i think um you think that that may be on the horizon one of these days <laughs> we heard right? it here first right <laughs> <laughs> all right anton is there anything we didn't cover that uh you want our guests to know um maybe about the macy's transaction i don't know if you guys have been following that but i think yeah. it's a super interesting uh, thing that's happening right now you know i think they're still in due diligence so the mm -hmm. arc house is the the company that is trying to acquire macy's the rational being that uh, macy's is trading at about the five billion market cap right when the real estate that macy's owns is worth anywhere between five to fifteen yeah. billion mm -hmm. yeah um and it's a transaction that might happen the bid is at uh, 24 dollars a share um i bought some macy's shares at 19. now i think they're at 21 maybe I don't know if it will happen, but I think it's a very, you know, super interesting alternative yeah. way to invest in real estate and people should follow this kind of uh, questions. Actually, yeah, very yeah. And given the department store, like redevelopment trends over the past yeah. several years, there's some, there's some value to be unearthed there potentially over, over time. <laughs> Definitely. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining Thank us you. today. We enjoyed the of conversation. Course. Thank you, Anton. My pleasure. Thank <laughs> you. This podcast is a production of Gregory FCA. If you enjoyed our discussion, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.